morning, everybody. So we are gathered here today to have a very special conversation about stereotyping. Um, I think that some of you may recognize Sue. Sue has been a guest on our podcast before. Would you like to say hello and introduce yourself? Hello. Um, my name, I go by Slucifer. Uh, I've got the Skeptical Satanist podcast that working on rebooting right now and hopefully have some episodes up by next month. Um, but uh, yeah, I've... I've talked to you about my deconversion and things and uh, Satanism and we've had, we've had a few conversations and gotten to know each other a little bit. I've got uh, independent fundamentalist uh, Baptist background and it's got a lot of similarities to, to this, the fundamentalist side with uh, the religion you, you grew up in as well. So let yeah. me, let me just go there. So like part of why we're having this conversation is because Slu and I were talking about um, what we were told about each other's religions when we were growing up. And we realized that it's stereotyping, like we stereotyped each other. And so right. then we, we thought about this and it's like, how, how do we look at each other? when we were told like i thought that that they had a funny hook nova which is like a funny belief and and that the the people you know they they just didn't properly like practice hey look at the trees good morning hey Denver. <laughs> um i i thought that that they were people to be afraid of because I didn't know that there was hope for their souls. So with that being said, like, what did you learn about Amish people? Like, what was your stereotypes oh, about man. Amish people? Um, there, there were stereotypes that I'd heard you, you bring up before about, um, like the ignorance or, you know, things of that nature, not educated or knowing, not of the world so being i guess not that wouldn't be what would you call that naive i guess or something along those lines um which i guess you mentioned is kind of on purpose in a way uh to influence people to think that that they are um but yeah and the funny part is a lot of it's hypocritical like a lot of these stereotypes are very hypocritical because our our church was just as guilty of it they had problem with you guys using the roads because of taxes because you aren't paying taxes to to help repair the roads or whatever well you're in wagons that are... let me let me let me burst your bubble a little bit yeah there are amish people that pay taxes yeah let me let me just burst that bubble a little <laughs> tiny bit but continue but regardless even if that was the case like our church didn't pay taxes either you know what i mean the church exempt the tax <laughs> exemption thing for churches is for all of them so it's like what it was ridiculous like you know i obviously don't uh believe these things now but that was a couple of the things and they're okay so like the the taxes is one thing is there another thing um, there were things about, I mean, some of it was, I, I guess the way you guys dressed and stuff, but that's even, what was, what was it where, like, you can't, was it, you can't wear buttons or something, or there's something about that. Is that, well, now is that see, with all see, but, stuff? but here's the thing, here's the thing is like. It's not that Amish people can't wear buttons because, you know, we had buttons on our men's shirts and their yeah. pants. But women in all five of the communities that I lived in could not use buttons on our clothing. We had to use straight pins. The non-fancy straight pins. They weren't allowed to look pretty. Hold on. Hold on a second. They weren't allowed to look pretty like like this. Can you see yeah. that? Or like this. 
they weren't allowed to look pretty like that but it's also like indicative of just like how common like stereotyping is because there's also um amish are there's many different brands and flavors of amish there's new order Amish, there's Amish Mennonites, there's old order Amish, there's Swartz and Trouber Amish, there's Troyer Amish, there's a Yoder Amish, there's a Byler Amish, there's like a gazillion different sects. So you can't pigeonhole them all into like this. Right. Because when you do that, you end up being wrong in what you're believing and what you're talking about. But buttons okay glad to know we can use buttons i mean we I mean, as vagina havers but the men <laughs> so I, i'm just saying oh uh, that's that's actually hilarious buttons are for penis havers only the, the <laughs> <laughs> That, I mean, that just killed, it always killed me with the stereotypes with those kinds of things anyways. And I guess that could trail off onto other out, outside of what we're talking about specifically with it. But yeah, the idea that you can pinpoint things down to gender with like colognes and you know, scents, like how does this scent remind you of dicks or vaginas? I don't understand because they aren't anything to do with these things. You know what I mean? <laughs> they're not no we they society sexualizes things in so many ways or or, or puts even them into genders and things it's so weird applies gender roles to toys right yeah toys don't have a gender right they shouldn't i mean last i checked <laughs> toys don't have a gender y'all yeah. they don't have a gender thanks i mean <clears throat> yeah so but we had other like it wasn't just with um you guys i i could bring up some other ones where it was like okay go ahead um well they would say that that churches that use different versions of the bible other than the king james version um they would say that those were watering down the the verses <laughs> of christianity and um they would they would say that like uh this was another thing that was in my mind and i don't know how it had to have been something that was said by my church and and just the community in general but quakers for some reason i had it in my head that quakers were these strict fire and brimstone type of uh people similar to amish and mennonites and like i've i've known quakers since that like i've talked to that there are sects of them that are so much more lenient than anything that i was ever or you know, in the sense of uh, the fire and brimstone thing, like it was much worse in in my church than what it was in in their upbringing or anything. So yeah. it's so weird to see that stuff. You know, after deconverting, seeing these uh, weird, just the, right. the weird hypocrisy of it all that that was that was being strewn about. Catholics was another one. I'd always heard this thing about they were kind of fire and brimstone people oh, and stuff. Well, and it's like some maybe, but not, not many. Like there was a lot of Catholics that were, they they went to church way less than what I did. And <clears throat> the preaching and stuff that I was indoctrinated into was, yeah, way. Yeah. So let me interrupt and say good morning, Ryan welcome i'm glad you're here thanks for listening um but also like i have to tell you that we our preachers would actually preach about the catholics against the catholic church just look at the catholic church yeah. and see what happened to them and and it wouldn't like we didn't have a pulpit there's no pulpit you just stand at the intersection between like the preachers would stand at the intersection between the living room and the kitchen because we didn't have a church right our <laughs> homes were our church yeah. and and so they would be standing there and i'll never forget like how they they stand there or they're seen in front of like a group or whatever like anyways so there's like this whole like 
one big room with like everybody there and they'd be going on and on and on about the travesties of the catholic church and like how bad it is and like i don't even remember the things they said but you know what i do remember i remember how it made me feel i i remember it being to the effect that these other denominations of christians were hypocrites like it was almost yes! like trying to shove push the blame off on them and be like, but look at us though we aren't we're we're, we're not like this, this. yeah <laughs> like the let me pat myself on the back like right <laughs> this we're not like this we've done something we're not like this yeah we're not like the catholic church we're not like the mennonites we're not like the baptists oh 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 another one that we had a lot of prejudice against was like the jehovah's witnesses oh my god did we ever have prejudice against them oh if you even if the jehovah's witnesses come by you shut the door in their face you do not talk to them. See, Hannah, funny hooklava. They'd be like, that that funny so, belief. And if you just talk to them, then they will lead you astray. I'm, so I've, I've got a question about that. Did you guys go to like fairs or events and stuff in your, your count, county or area or anything to sell goods and stuff? Or did you oh my no no okay no that is way too worldly See, we've had we've had amish that do that around our area that but we were not those amish. oh no and they, things, so. that really ditch. okay okay <laughs> that's hilarious <laughs> okay like no no we were the real old order amish like right. we we didn't go that worldly that just was too far <laughs> okay no we were the real christians <laughs> the yeah true christians but it's like here's the thing is that when i talk about how did it so make did, me feel did you guys refer to yourselves as christians or was it mostly amish oh no we would be abhorred by somebody referring to us as christians so you wouldn't recognize Christianity as being even a part of your religion at all, even though... Like, I, I, I grew up the... thinking that Christian was a bad word. Wow. See, we we wavered between those things, and it was kind of like... Now, as I don't... much as we accused other religions of being wishy-washy that were basically the same religion that we had, except for one little part tweaked here or there... Like, you know, as much as we did that, we were very wishy-washy on those things. Like, <laughs> yeah, well, part of me, part of me wants to say this, though, is there are Amish people that consider themselves Christians. And I want yeah. people to know that. But I didn't grow up thinking of myself as a Christian. I grew up thinking of myself as Amish and Christians are of the world and they have funny beliefs. And I was afraid of them. I was terrified of them. See, it was I was terrified that if I talked to them in an open manner, that they would lead me astray and there would be no hope for my soul and then I would be forever lost. See, that was something that they kind of, they touched on, but it was this thing of like, well, if you have enough faith and you can go out there and you can preach to them and convert them or whatever. And it's Oh, like, but we don't we proselytize. That. Right. We don't do that. I have to say that. We don't proselytize. Don't. Yeah. Yeah, we we proselytize. We were oh no no no! That, that, to be born yeah. into the church is the privilege and the gift you were given. We were we were given that privilege and gift. <laughs> but I think like what's what's interesting to me, and and the reason that we're talking about these beliefs and things that we were taught is that it's it's stereotyping, it's stereotyping. Because the stereotype that to be born into the church is is like a, a privilege. That's from the church, from within the church. That's beliefs that we hold within the church. And then the stereotype of like all of these people, like Slew here, is of the world. And I just, you know, I just don't know if there's any hope for his, their soul. So I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there, Slew. I just, I have grave <laughs> concerns, right? So, like, how does that affect your ability to connect with people 
And how does that allow you to have meaningful interactions with people beyond surface level interactions? Right. Because if you're going out there and you're being a witness, and I have to ask this, if you're going out there and you're being a witness to the world and you're shining your light and you can convert them, blah, 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 blah. Are you ever approaching people from a place of like they are worthy, valid human beings, whether they join your church or not? Oh, no. No, because everybody's of filthy rags. They're <laughs> right. Do you see my rags I'm wearing today? Yeah. Oh, I got rags on. Were you did you, like that was one of the verses that they they really beat on with their indoctrination was that you're of filthy rags. You aren't worthy of God's, you know, you know, love and forgiveness or anything. But he did this the martyrdom thing. He did this great thing to made this great sacrifice to, to save you. And um, yeah, the, the only people that are going to heaven are the ones that believe that Jesus was the savior that came to die for them and for their sins and stuff. So in that Twice. setting, they think that's the only truth and everything. And that that's, yeah. Yeah. So twice a year, we had special church services and they were called Grossme and Atningsme. Okay, so Atningsme came first and Atning means the, the ordno, the rules church, right? And then um, secondly, once the, the rules church was had, then we would have the the gross me, which is translates to the big church. But both of those church services were highly, highly focused on the martyrdom and how Jesus died for our sins. And we're all of like, you know, we're nothing without repenting and, and believing and all of this stuff. But they were also really lengthy. And, and the thing about that was, is that Grossme and Ottningsme can go anywhere from like six to eight hours, as in the length of church service. Imagine having like six to eight hours of basically chanting, um, singing, praying, and hearing about how Jesus suffered. Imagine that. What do you think that did? Girl, Rayon, look, let, let me show you something. I got a tattoo here. I got I got tattoos. There you go. My filthy rags are, right. are, are well done. <laughs> Don't tell me how to live my life. Right. You're not my dad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. But I mean, like the effects of that, like when you hold that kind of belief and you have all of this input of like the suffering and how like you're nothing, the effects of that, like how does that affect you? Yeah. That and, and what do you do with that? So like, are you approaching people from a belief or a belief that they're valuable? You're no, you're approaching people from an insecure position to begin with. You're you're insecure with yourself at that point. They've made it to where you're relying on something else for your your um, your own worth. You because you aren't worth something. You need to be dedicating your life towards something that is, and that something is God, right? So. That it takes away your your self worth entirely, and that, yeah, that's what forces people like our religion. That was what forced us to indoctrinate other people too, was that we were saving souls, right? So at least that's a worthy cause towards God or whatever. It's putting all of your your value on another uh, on authority, basically at that point, which ties into horrible things that can. So if all of that, your value... that line of logic and reasoning in society, that can contribute to all kinds of abuse and, and horrible effects. So to, to, to make sure I'm understanding what you're saying correctly, you said it, it relies on authority. So this authority that is 
appointed by God telling you what you're supposed to be doing in life, which is also another human being that's also valuable, just like me or you. We're right. all capable of making mistakes. We're all capable of, of messing up. We're all capable of screwing it up. We don't always get it right. Nobody is infall is in infallible. We we don't have that kind of, of ability as humans. And to be human is really to err. And I don't remember who said that, but it is the truth. Right. So where is your humanity in being subservient to or compliant with the rules as appointed to you by somebody who has decided that this is the rule? That right. you must have no value, that you are of nothing, and that this is how you gain value, but you can't really ever gain value because you're never really worthy of any value. Where's the such a where's mix. the logic in this? Yeah. Yeah. Like anybody have thoughts on that? I, you know, I noticed also when um I was thinking about all of this, the, the, when we were talking about like the stereotyping from the outs, cause there's, we'd split it up, right? We've got stereotyping inside the church between different denominations and everything. And then we've got, um, kind of, you know, all of that opposing factors and then towards society outside of the church as well, because we had our stereotypes against atheists differently than we did against people that were just in a different brand of Christianity, like yourself or, you know, um, Oh, but I wasn't a Christian. Oh, right. Right. I was Amish. Okay. So yeah, we've, we've got that as well, where we had, uh, this idea of the heathens that weren't part of any, you know, uh, denomination of Christian, but still they all got thrown in and lumped together at the end of the day because it was just outside of our beliefs and they were going to hell anyway. Yeah. And, and <clears throat> we didn't have the ability because of the stereotyping. And when we understand how stereotyping affects bias and prejudice, which leads to discriminatory behavior, but first, let's we'll get to that in a minute, but let's let's talk about this. Ryan says, of course we have no value. The only value we have is when we're given to the church. Nothing is ever enough. It was the purpose of what we were taught. I think you're right. Like that's it's by design, isn't it? It's really weird too, because for how much Chris, like Christianity influenced our country as well whenever it came to politics and stuff like that. I'm not going to go too deep into it. But um, as far as like the war efforts and things and the propaganda we kind of fed everybody and that was that was going on at the time, there are things that kind of tie into this as well. Um, you you have you you kind of have uh, these same stereotypes floating with those things. Um. I'm sorry, I'm about to get off track. <laughs> get me back on track, Mary. I've had too much caffeine. I 100% <laughs> feel like it's by design. Ancient religions were not as dogmatic, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, fair enough. I mean, I think it's by design, but it also, like the stereotyping itself, what it does effectively is so you have these, if you have ever read like some of the, Things that or or listen to like Steve Hessen's work, which is like um, the bite model. If you know about that, behavior control, information control, thought control, and emotional control. Yep. Um, the the churches often the various branches of churches, like the five churches that I lived in, it was all done by a variety of ways. So they controlled the way we dressed. They controlled, like, we weren't supposed to have anger because anger is always a bad thing. Never mind the fact that, like, if you read the Bible, Jesus actually had righteous anger. Like, right. like so if we're supposed to be like Jesus and Jesus had righteous anger and Jesus did all these things, like, where there's a dichotomy there like you right. can't how do you reconcile that well how do you and and so 
like yeah we... well there there's this fear love fear love love fear yeah weird dynamic there going on that that you you want to fear this thing and love it at the same time um what i was actually getting to sorry i i just got back on track with the thought that i had um but when ryan was talking about nothing is ever enough it's the uh the purpose of what we're taught so with yes. that dictators unruly dictators we have this thing in our mind here that we're taught that this is you know this is horrible that you're you're uh um that these dictators take over this country make all these decisions for everybody implant these things into people's heads and brainwash them into these things but what's the the church is doing those same things and it's just getting completely right. glossed over right because... and christianity is reinforcing all of those it's the same exact thought processes and it's in the bible it's clear as can be well and then they also like they employ DARVO, which is, yep. do you know what DARVO is? Deny, attack, reverse victim and offender roles. It's a, a tactic yep. used by narcissists Yep. Uh, quite commonly. And yeah, it's funny that there's a narcissistic God that this Bible is based off of. So <laughs> I always find it interesting. I find it very interesting because I feel like, um, you know, maybe it's like, remember that with great power comes great responsibility whoever said that why can i not remember things today um but whoever said that was was like spot on like like loving your abuse your abuser um as as this commenter says loving your abuser yeah. is the definition of an abusive relationship isn't it god only the, hits you because he loves you that's what, what i was getting at too you take it outside of that context and you try to put it into another context into our reality of what's real and what we know is morally right and wrong or ethics or however you want to like we've talked right. about those getting used interchangeably sometimes but yeah <laughs> yeah, you you look at it in that context and you say, well, if it's this situation, what makes it different than that one? Why does religion get to be the caveat for these things? Oh, oh, somebody says, I'm pretty sure God was angry multiple times too. The I'm wrath just of God. To be Isn't that more godlike. Yeah. Isn't that something to be revered as the wrath of God? Yeah. His yeah. And I mean, talked about a good bit in there too. Hey. Hey, we got it. We got it. Somebody knows with great power comes great responsibility is totally from the first <laughs> Spider-Man movie. <laughs> oh, it's from the comics went much before that. But yeah. <laughs> wow. See, this Celsior. is I'm, 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 I'm pop culture illiterate. Like I know a few <laughs> things, but I don't even know where it comes from. But yes, I guess I'm just trying to be more godlike. Okay, <laughs> that's that's my that's my line now. I'm gonna be more godlike. You know, if you really look at the example that Jesus said in the Bible, and and you think about it, like he really was a pot stirrer. <laughs> and if there's nothing else in the world that I am, I am a pot stirrer. I mean, there might there was some evidence of there being cannabis residue around one of the places where he supposedly preached, so, <laughs> uh, archaeologically. So maybe he was a pot stirrer in that sense. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he drove the money changers from the temple with a whip. Like, you, you do you really want to go there? Let's go there. He wasn't. He wasn't like yeah. Anyways, so so there's that. But regardless, I think back to our topic of like stereotyping. So one of the things that we know that happens. Um, oh, but first, first, this is a point. Be less godlike. It only leads to genocide and holy wars. This is true. Yeah. So I can't really go there. Darn it. It was funny. Oh, my God. He had long hair and wore sandals. You know, Jesus smoked weed. <laughs> Traveled around with a group of 12 men. I'm just saying. Um, you know, but, he smelled like hemp. <laughs> I mean, but anyways, we're, we're, we're going out there. Hemp so the other. <laughs> the other <laughs> Let's part. Let's not go there. <laughs> the other part 
that I think is really important to understand about stereotyping is that how does stereotyping affect people? Stereotyping evokes an emotion that can neither be positive or negative, which then creates bias. And that can be like, for example, if like in the, in the case of like Amish stereotyping, how does this work with the stereotyping from the outside world of these peaceful, gentle people? What has happened is that when people like myself start talking about the abuse that we experience, people have this bias and, and even prejudice, um, let me make sure I get this absolutely right because it's really important to me to say it correctly. So they have this bias of they believe, they tend to believe because of the stereotypes that they are better than other people, that they are closer to God. And basically, they have a strong feeling of like for Amish people because of it. They believe of them that they are closer to God, that they are better, that they are all of these things because of the stereotyping, because of the positive stereotyping. And so what happens is that if I start talking about my abuse, the people who hold these stereotypes and have this bias and this prejudice they will literally gaslight us. Yeah. They will respond with, but Amish people aren't really like that. They will respond with, but Amish culture is really like this. There are people who have built their entire careers off of the backs of Amish children, dead Amish children. Amish children commit suicide because of this kind of rhetoric, and it goes unnoticed by the outside world. I even see it to the point of like, there's some, um, oh, there's some quotes and things out there that are kind of, they're supposed to be deep and meaningful or whatever. And they're, they got these positive, I call it like toxic positivity. These things that are kind of, they, they, I, I don't know. There's this fake sense of positivity about them and that you can see it with like, I hate to do that. I'm going to stereotype again. But like the yoga groups and things, I'll see a lot of it coming out of those. those yep. Groups. Yep. Um, and it'll often bleed over into like the LGBTQ community and stuff as well, because it's kind of viewed as a more peaceful uh, attitude and things. But at the end of the day, they're kind of doing the same things. They're they're normalizing these behaviors into those groups is what it is. Yes. And it, it, it ends up leading to more stereotyping and everything which is it's it's harmful it's normalizing these uh bigoted ways of thinking um and that leads to laws and things being neglectful towards people that are yeah uh, victims of abuse and things if for nothing else know <clears throat> this if you're listening to this i want you to understand this wisconsin versus yoder is a discriminatory law that denies Amish children basic human rights. That's it. The end. There are laws that create discrimination based off of those stereotypes. Understand that we have to actually talk about these things and we have to spread the word. We have to share this information because if we don't talk about it, the problem doesn't exist. Like, thank you for bringing that up, Sleuth, that the, it results in discrimination. Yeah. Because this isn't just like one group or two groups. This law affects many groups of high control religious groups. Wisconsin versus Yoder has denied all of those children basic human rights. Yeah, and it's unfortunately not just one law or one, you know, there's bill mills out there that are being funded by churches like I grew up in um, and legal teams and stuff looking to to fight for just their beliefs that are oppressive towards other people. And they view it as protecting their religious, you know, 
liberties or whatever. And it's nonsense. How the fuck is that culturally competent? That's, that's Darvo right there for you. That is Darvo. So, yeah, it's it's a very uh, serious topic to get into with these things. And whenever I started trying to think of um, like these stereotypes of like the outside in towards mm -hmm. Christians, like when I was still in uh, when I was still a Christian, I was thinking that there were all of these stereotypes going on then of atheists thinking that uh, we were dumb or uh, the holy rollers and there there's some truth to these things like as I think or I see it as that way for me personally like um, I've had people say that I was intelligent and stuff in school but at the same time I have a hard time believing that um, whenever it felt more like instead of intelligence, I had this thing of just repeating things or memorization and things the same way that I was doing with Bible verses. I was doing it with uh, things in school, subjects in school, but it was never it was never in a way that was thinking those things all the way through and knowing why or having any reasoning behind these things, because it was still faith based thinking that I was relying on at the end of the day. So, like, I almost see that as, yeah, I was dumbing myself down in my faith. And it's hard to get around that. It's hard to not. But those things are attached to a book, an actual oh. thing that has, you know, tells you to ignore. It's a physical object, which helps people believe and have blind faith. But right. also, were you conditioned to believe that? Yeah. Were you conditioned to conduct yourself in that manner? And what would you tell somebody if they were experiencing this very same thing? Right. I'm I'm saying answer that question. Tell me. What would you tell somebody? Like if I said those very same words to you, what would you say? Oh, what's that? That I that that I feel like I dumbed myself down, but I did these things because that's what I was taught to do. Like Yeah. Yeah, what would you say to me? I mean, you were indoctrinated into those things, and that that isn't, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know, because I have trouble with it with myself, so I don't even know what to tell myself in those situations, really. The way that, well, I don't know that it would be appropriate to tell somebody else that. Yeah. Uh, let me put it that way, because I have a different way of, um, of thinking about it, because it, it, it's very personal to me. I don't, mm -hmm. um, so I think that, I kind of have seen it as I was brainwashed into those things. And in that sense, I was doing, I was putting things together the best way that I could in, in that situation, I guess, um, mm -hmm. for survival, I guess, in a way, but they shame. Yeah. Do they shame the educated? Yeah, they do. Yeah. What do you think that results in you? Like, how do you think that result uh, well, affects, the, like, your ability to think about yourself? Okay, so here's the thing. They actually, this is part of that, um, that I was starting to get into with the stereotyping. I was thinking that atheists, I, I had this in my mind, that atheists were thinking that they were better than us that they were, you know, smarter and all of that. And they think they're more well-educated and <laughs> things of that nature. And this was actually like a, I don't think that's true now. You know, I don't think that about. Chief? Okay. Based on our earlier conversation, I have to ask this question. Do you feel like that could have been projection? Yeah. Yeah. That is a, Right. To me, like that is a classic example of projection. Right. But now you're in a place where you don't see that as being true. And why do you think that's not true? What makes it untrue for you? I've, because I'm an atheist now, I don't think that about, you know, Christians now or anything. Um, 
and I've known plenty that don't like I and not only that atheists don't go by some set of book for their a book of like morals to guide them in these things so to try to put those things on something like that you're talking about a multitude of people that with different beliefs on all of that um whenever I I'd come out of Christianity and everything I had to find a better epistemology for myself to sort through things to figure out what's right and wrong what's moral what isn't and all of that because i was taught that only morals and ethics come from the bible you know um so going through all of that other people haven't some people don't grow up in the same environment that i did and they don't they've come to these conclusions differently so mm -hmm you know, whatever their morals are or ethics or they're going to be, they could be completely different than mine. And a, a lot of times they are. So it's a mixed bag in that, that, that concept. So I like, I, I see that now for what yeah. it is, but. You know, so one of our listeners says brainwashing and indoctrination <clears throat> is powerful. And what's looking once out of that fog, looking back is really strange. That's true. That's why they push to keep you young and dumb, like you're a perpetual child needing the greatest fa oh, father yeah. figure, God. Um, that's all fine and dandy, but also like going back to the how like you're one of the things that I myself experienced was the inability to to make decisions. I didn't think that I could make decisions as a result of all of these things that I was taught to believe the brainwashing um, when you when you experience so much brainwashing you do what you have to do to survive your basic survival instincts will kick in yeah so sometimes i find it helpful to literally sit there and tell myself i'm not there anymore i have learned better i know better i do better and i am a better person for not being a part of that church. I have learned tools. I have different tools that I can employ. Which tool would feel best for me right now? Like sometimes that tool is writing. Sometimes that tool is creating art. Sometimes that tool is remaking an Amish dress in a color I wasn't allowed to wear and in a way that I was never allowed to wear it. Yeah. Sometimes that tool is recreating a quilt block with my my real life friends and, and family, my chosen family, that means so much more to me than the quilt that I made with my egg donor that she refused to allow me to have and instead gave me a quilt that I was brutally raped on. Sometimes it means going out in nature and sitting by the river. It just depends on where I am and what I need in that moment. And I think that when we learn to trust our instincts, we find it easier to employ the toolbox that we now have versus falling back into feeling like we only have the toolbox that we had back then. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I know that question, There's... does that make sense, was a trauma response? I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, there's a comment there. Yeah, I was just looking at that one. Yeah, we they were... keep you in that bubble. I was thinking that too, whenever, um, whenever somebody else... I, I'm not sure. 0125 AR. I guess we've had a talk in Discord. I don't know which yeah. server, but um, when they were talking about that perpetual child needing the greatest father figure, God, yeah, they're you're they're putting you in a bubble to keep you protect you in that environment, keep you indoctrinated into it and everything. And I saw it with uh, more some families that had more money in the communities that in my area that were part of the church that had businesses and stuff, um, they would send their kids to private schools or they would homeschool them so that they didn't, they weren't <laughs> exposed to the 
non-Christian beliefs and things or, um, yeah, things like evolution and all of that. Um, there were a lot of ways that they would keep you in a bubble to try to protect you from other thinking that was outside of their beliefs. Which is like one of the commenters, um, Stephen says, <laughs> we were kept in a familiar environment and away from the community for our own protection, right? Like it's a separatist attitude that also comes as a result of the stereotyping. Yeah. I, I, I think it comes from that. Do you think it comes from that? Yeah, I, I think it comes from that. Well, I mean, we're really talking about tribalism yeah. as well. When it, so it's kind of, yeah. It, it's, okay. it's, it's, um, it's kind of intertwined with, um, what is that word? Colonialism? colonialism like i don't know if that's the word like for what i'm thinking of but it's like how like the the white supremacy movement that basically decides value like it's inherently racist and has resulted in mass genocide of people yeah over and over I mean, the, but, that that could be a deep subject to get into. <laughs> oh my! System, uh, systemic, systemic racism and everything. Yeah, yeah, systemic racism and everything could be a really, um, yeah. I I just think that there's so many intertwining levels that it's really helpful to explore some of those, and and where does it all begin? And some of it is because of the stereotyping. This is why we do, like, do we understand why we believe the things that we believe? And do we understand why we do the things we do? Like, if we hold a belief that, let's just say that disabled people, you know, they need rescuing or whatever, whatever, or like autistic people need to be cured or like, if we hold those kinds of beliefs, where do they come from? And why? What led us to that conclusion? And is there anything that we would change about those beliefs? Because I'm talking about, like, for example, when you start talking about um, the people that think that autism needs to be cured, and this is kind of off topic, but not really, because it's still stereotyping. It's the people who who sit there and they do things like they literally kill their own children because of these experimental things that they're doing because they hold such a strong belief that they must, they must have a child that, that meets the societal norm and they fail to recognize the humanity in their autistic child and they kill them and it happens repetitively. So where did those people's beliefs come from and what feeds that belief and allows them to sit in that belief to that point? Not only that, but like, how about the rejection of modern medicine and things as well that happens in a lot? Oh, there not, you go. Not just, you know, the Amish community, but a lot of Christian communities as well and that mm -hmm. tie into these things. Well, let's just talk about like the fact that I, <clears throat> I mean, I was born at home. If there is like, you know, church in our homes. I was born at home. My grandmother was the midwife. Um, you know, was I born in a church? And as, as Ryan says, like no blood transfusions. And again, it kind of the same conspiratorial mindset that it takes for these things. It still seems to be that same thing that we were talking about earlier with uh, people having this, the religion itself causing this form of like, uh, you know this insecurity Bias. in yourself and not being able to Bias so you're, and you're kind of it, you have these feeding feelings. on your fears they're feeding on your fears that they've instilled in you already you they want you to be fearful and you connect fear with love now so, so i thought it's so weird i thought creepy that <laughs> the world was filled with people 
who all they did was sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That was yeah. pretty much it. That's what I thought the world well, I've, was. I've heard my pastor bring up there was there was uh yeah there were uh, he had preached on this subject a few times and bringing up that as a stereotype basically for worldly right. things and all of that yeah and and here's the thing the reason that I escaped is because it was worse to stay there than yeah. it was to escape yeah it had to get worse than the fear I had of the world and then I got to learn from people like for example like the person one of the people that helped me escape was an atheist and the thing that I learned from that experience is that people are just people and whenever you get a group of people some of them commit crimes or they have values that are incompatible with my values right or they have values that while they're not the same as mine, we are still compatible as having a friendship, a relationship. And, and that in and of itself was enabled because I had like massive trauma therapy while I was still a teenager. And, and I'm talking like actual trauma therapy, y'all. I had EMDR therapy when I was 19. And I had intensive EMDR therapy. I can't describe to you what that was like. But it probably saved my life. Because I understood that due to the actions that the abusive people had taken in my life. And due to the actions of the church leadership. And due to the actions of my own family. That if I stayed in this environment, I was going to die either by my own hand or somebody else's hand, but I was going to die young. There was no doubt, and there still is no doubt. But the point is, is that that fear that I had from all of that stereotyping, it took months just to process that fear. And then it took the curiosity to get to see people as humans beyond what I was taught to believe. And maybe you might find it a different way. I don't know. Everybody is different and we all experience things through the lens of which we, what we have experienced. I, I feel like once I kind of removed um, faith as a, a concept and things that I, to, to take seriously and whenever I found like... Um, I started to find stable ground to where I was looking at things more towards like from tools like empathy and, and compassion that it's, you know, those, um, those concepts, having that, that mindset, it, it helped a lot with, with, uh, my deconversion. Um, it, it kept me grounded in something that wasn't just, you know, flagrant just opinion or whatever it was being taken on faith um sorry what what was that that comment that came up it kind of caught my eye and got me oh i'm sorry it's so okay. one of our listeners says it works for some and not others i'm from a mennonite family i learned to lie about myself early but when it came to light i thought it couldn't get better Life was tough, but I grew stronger and better. Out of seven kids in my family, only my youngest sister is still Mennonite with six kids and she can have it. Right. That's another thing. I, I want to po point on this because people think that speaking up about abuse means you hate people. Yeah. I learned something very important. How we talk about the groups that we were a part of also reflects somewhat in many cases how we feel about ourselves and here's the thing if i didn't care about my people i would just go on about my life i don't have to do this i would never speak another word about amish people i would never speak another word about my life experiences 
I think there's this idea too that it's bad to question beliefs. Like in society, it's kind of been that's something that's been normalized, I think, out of Christianity is that it's it's wrong to question beliefs. And I think it's that pushback that gives us kind of our morals and ethics to begin with that we can agree on. It's without that pushback, what are you doing? You're just in your little echo chamber of this are you is ever... right and this is wrong and but the more we learn about humanity, the more we know and the better equipped we are to be right. able to be empathetic and supportive and compassionate towards one another and to develop meaningful relationships. The more we know, knowledge is, is what is going to get you to a place where you feel like your life has meaning. Knowledge, in my opinion. Yeah. At least that's what got me to that place. Knowledge. Knowledge is power, y'all. I'm just saying. Mm -mm -mm. People. That's my hippie sibling up there. Had. Hippie sibling up there doing <laughs> hippie things. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I'm pretty I sure tease. some. I can tease them a little bit. <laughs> some other people might be doing things like that. Right. But um, regardless, we're. We're we're gonna have to wrap this up for today. I think we might have to come back and talk some more about different stereotypes. And you know, I kind of think it would be really interesting to see if Rion would um, like to come talk about stereotypes, and we could do like a like a Amish versus Baptist versus like JWs. Wouldn't oh, that be cool? That would be great. Yeah. <laughs> and if there's somebody else that wants to come, like even if like. Stefan, for example, if you want to come talk about Mennonite stereotypes, come on. Like, <laughs> I think it would be so fun to have this conversation and to kind of highlight the stereotypes that we saw and, and to understand better how they affect what we do today. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it would be great. But with that being said, do you have anything you'd like to say to our listeners today? Um, well, I used to do this a good bit, but let me, uh, I've already talked about my podcast and all that, but there's a, um, we were talking about this earlier. There's a, an organization called recovering from religion, recovering from religion.org. Um, they, it's run by Dr. Daryl Ray, or it's been started by him. I don't know who's running it now, but it's a, a very good organization that if you're coming out of uh, your religion and you need help processing that, um, they help with those things and help. They can help. I believe they have tools and things to be able to help you with those things and people there to talk to because it can be re very rough if you're questioning your your entire you know, <laughs> upbringing and everything and uh the things you were taught that were true and you're finding out that maybe they weren't it's a very confusing time and and very can be very troubling so i always try to bring them up um and tell people to look into that and there's also uh tied with that there's the um secular therapy project seculartherapy.org um where they can help you possibly find somebody in your area that's a good therapist for uh religious trauma and things of that nature that other therapists might not necessarily understand properly and be able to help with so yeah i want to throw those out there before we end i guess those are some really good resources i mean i think that i would like to thank all of our listeners for being here with us today and i'd like to thank you for your conversation so thank you like yeah, it means a you. lot to be able to have these conversations i think it's critical and like changing how we look at things or you know evolving how we evolve as as we go through life um and i want to thank our patreon subscribers for making this episode possible i appreciate you and i want to thank um the rest of the people who have all worked to make this happen I think um, if it wouldn't be for any of you, this wouldn't exist because all of you have inspired me and many of the people that work with the Misfit Amish to be able to speak. And I appreciate that. And I want everybody to know that 
regardless of where you are in life, you are worthy. You are worthy of basic human rights. You are worthy of love, compassion, and empathy. And love does not have to feel like fear. Have a blessed Sunday.